Hello there, it's Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher, jumping on here quite late today on Tuesday, and today is December the 10th, and I am unfortunately really, really late. So many of you um, who are probably watching this now as a recording were wondering, where was Mark? Why, would, why did he not go live at noon when he normally was supposed to? Well, I had this important client phone call that I had to take and it took 45 minutes and so unfortunately I was not able to be a uh, to, to join right at noon so my sincerest apologies to all of you people that have been patiently waiting and it is about five minutes to 1 p.m. right now <clears throat> and so um, <laughs> it looks like Ralph is here he says yes you're late I am Ralph Sorry about that, guys. So we'll wait a little bit for people to jump on as they are joining. Um, today is an interesting day. We're going to talk a little bit about those family members that you have in Canada where it's going to be difficult for you to be able to prove that they're actually your relative. Um, why? Well, maybe like some families, you know, maybe you're the black sheep in the family and you have you don't have a good relationship with them. You know, maybe they just, uh, you know, they're, they're just not um, on good terms with you. And so because of that, you can't get the documentation you need. And that's a reality and that happens sometimes. So we're going to talk about that today. And I see people jumping on here. Um, Chidi is from Nigeria. Hello, welcome. And you guys that are joining now too, make sure that you post in the comments where you're listening from. Um, and uh, Maria says hi. And Dorcas says hi. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. So I have a bunch of uh, uh, questions that were sent in by listeners here that I'm going to talk about. And uh, we'll cover those ones first as we always do. And then after that, we will shift gears and we will uh, get into answering all of the live questions that people have. So once again, I want to express a sincere apology for not being able to go live right at noon. Sometimes that happens. And uh, I also want to let you know that this background that you see right here in my office with this beautiful lighting and everything is probably not going to be here in the future. <laughs> Friday is my last day here at Stringham and, uh, and we will also be saying goodbye to Stephanie, which makes me very sad. But Stephanie is going to be staying here at, um, at my law firm Stringham LLP and I am launching my new firm. So it is going to be a virtual firm and I gave some of you a little bit of a teaser on Sunday with the video that I did when I was walking down to Cottonwood Park and oh my goodness you guys, I, I have got to share, well I don't know if I can share some of the pictures, I think they're probably on my phone here, but I had quite an adventure after I finished that video. So I'll share that with you guys in just a few minutes as we let other people tune in. Amir, good to see you from Egypt. And Amir, in the middle of April here, in a few months, I am going to be having the pleasure of going to Egypt to see the pyramids and stopping by Jordan to see Petra and then spending some wonderful time in Jerusalem, um, touring some of the, you know, the amazing uh, sites and places there that are found in the New Testament. So I'm really excited about that. Um, Christopher is from Ghana. Hi, Christopher. Uh, Siddharth is Kingston. Uh, great. Kingston, Ontario. Fantastic. He's got some flames there in his comments. So I'm not sure if Kingston is burning or you're just excited, uh, Siddharth, but <laughs> that's pretty funny comments. Um, we've got Katamba from Uganda. Welcome back, Katamba. It's always great to have you here tuning in. And um, we've just got a great group of people who, who are chiming in. Uh, Majid says hi. Is is from Sudan. We've got gr we've got a great African contingent today. So this is awesome. All right. So uh, what I want to do here, let's see if I can do this. I, I actually got myself a new phone and this phone here. I'm getting used to working it. But uh, the one thing I'm excited about this phone is that it has the ability to uh, to take much better pictures than my other one did. So <laughs> Siddharth says he's a top fan. Yay. And there's the flames. OK, that's awesome. So let me just see here. I want to share just a couple pictures. Actually, I wonder if I should share these pictures. Maybe not <laughs> because <laughs> it's somewhat gruesome uh, what I stumbled upon when I was hiking here the other day. But uh, let me see what I've got. And uh, 
I'll share a few little pictures here with you guys as we're waiting for other people to tune in. So those of you who are jumping on and the numbers are starting to climb, hang in there. Thank you so much for being patient with me. This EE Live Q&A is a little bit later than normal, um, but we're going to get to a bunch of very, very cool things. Uh, Boach says, that place you walked Sunday was awesome, waiting for the pics. Yes, I'm definitely going to share this with you. And I... Um, Let's just see what I can find here. I've got to make sure that I've got the pictures that are uh, uh, that are that are good to share because <laughs> when I got down to when I got down to the bottom of the um, uh, well, let's I'll, I'll, I'll hold off here. We'll let other people tune in. Udin is from Dhaka. Welcome, Udin. <laughs> and uh, Ketz, Ketzia is from Pennsylvania. Cool. All right, let's see here. I'm, I'm trying to find some pictures that are good, but that, that are not too, too gruesome. <laughs> but hey, this is my live video, and apparently I can share whatever I like. So uh, I'm going to share this with you guys, and you guys will find it very, very interesting. Okay, let's see. Okay, so there's the pictures. Okay, there's one. I think this is probably good here. And then I'm going to share this one that's probably good I don't think I want to share any <laughs> any more than that <laughs> so oh boy so all right <laughs> and we've got Udin from Dhaka Bangladesh awesome it's great to have you guys here okay let's see if I can get these moved over safely where I can share them with you I don't think I even shared these with Stephanie I have to share these she'll like these ones <laughs> uh, all right so here is what I've got for you guys so after I was hiking, and I think I shared some pictures with you guys, like this one here. Actually, I better separate them out. So I shared some pictures like this one, because I uh, it was about minus 13 degrees on Sunday, and so I went down to my favorite place, which is Cottonwood Park. And uh, Cottonwood Park is, uh, you can see the trees down there and a steep little path down. Mine are obviously the only tracks there as I took a picture back. But on the way down into that valley, I, um, I stumbled upon this. And I'm just going to overlay these pictures here. But you can hardly see it there. It, this is what I believe to be a coyote track. And so it's kind of like a wild dog that we have here in southern Alberta. And so I started following these tracks because this was a fresh, if I move this off, this was a fresh layer of snow. So anything that happened probably about midnight to, you know, when I was walking here about nine o'clock in the morning, this is all fresh. So they, they had not passed long before. So I thought, hmm, I'm going to just follow these tracks and see where they lead. So I followed these tracks and uh, um, let's just see here. <laughs> I stumbled upon this and I don't mean to gross you guys out too much, but... <laughs> Basically, this is what we call a kill site. <laughs> and so this is where the coyote and every, uh, uh, obviously there were a bunch of other animals. I know the magpies were down there. This is actually the remnants of a deer that was eaten. And so I've taken pictures of the beautiful deer that were down there and I watched them um, as they frolic around me and are quite tame because it's close to the city and they know it's a protected area. But unfortunately, this deer didn't make it. <laughs> So, so I'm sorry I didn't mean to, uh, to, to, to gross you guys out too much there, but uh, that was my experience on Sunday, and that's, uh, yeah, stumbling upon that, uh, that poor little deer there that, uh, well, it's the circle of life, right? <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> All right, so uh, Siddharth says, congratulations for the new farm, uh, firm market. It was, uh, yes, it was definitely a nice park down there. All right, Charles says he's got a question. Hold off on your question, Charles. And as soon as I get through some of these questions here, I'm not going to go through all of them because those of you who, who have patiently been waiting and are watching this live, I want to reward you guys. So these are questions we're going to cover today. Those of you who've jumped in, um, maybe for the first time, this is me, Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, every Tuesday at noon Mountain Standard Time, although today it's 1 o'clock p.m. Mountain Standard Time. I answer your questions about express entry and these express entry ones are have always been one of the most uh, important pillars to the growth of my firm and the way in which I can reach out to all of you and just give back 
uh, for all of the amazing, awesome clients that I have. And many, many of you have come through the Canadian Immigration Institute, the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group. And so I want to express sincere appreciation um, for, for all of you and many of you even here who are past clients. So thank you so much. And so this is my way of giving back. People who are watching this as a recording on the Canadian Immigration Institute YouTube channel or even as a recording um, in the Express Entry Law Group or on the Facebook page, um, those of you who are, who are tuning in as a recording, um, uh, if you want your question to be a uh, answered and you're not able to attend live, then all you need to do is send, and this is where I'm going to try to be a little bit, um, a little bit uh, creative because no longer are you going to be sending them to Stephanie. So for the time being, um, as I go forward and, um, and, uh, and hire some new people to, to join me, let's just see if I can find this. Uh, boy, I've got to clear out all of these, um, all of these little notifications here. Seriously, how hard is it to find? There it is. Okay, what is this one? Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny. I'll be honest, you guys. I'm I'm constantly trying to uh, improvise as I go here. Okay, I think I've got it now. Okay, let's see if we can get this right here. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Hooray! So this is what you do. So you type EE Live Q&A in the subject line and you send your email and really all future correspondence to mholthy at Holthy Law. So this one right here. So this is my new email address. And those of you who've known me for a while know that actually I had this email address before I joined Stringham. So if you have a question that you'd like me to answer, this is the new email and this was basically where all correspondence will go as of friday friday will be my last day here at stringham and and so um obviously if you forward information to stephanie she'll still get it and everything and i'm sure she's happy to forward it on to me um i'm really excited for billy and stephanie both in their opportunity here at stringham um, but if you uh, for whatever reason if you want to get your question answered here in the live Q&A um, and you're not able to attend live, just send me an email to mholthy at holthylaw.com and put EE Live Q&A in the subject line. All right. And the same thing goes for consults and all of those things. You can send those all to mholthy at holthylaw.com now. All right. So that is how it works. And then all of you awesome folks who are tuning in live, I'm going to dedicate a sizable amount of time to answer all of your questions just for being willing to be here. All right, so let's tackle the first one, which is really kind of the pillar. It's the, it's the capstone question of this EE Live Q&A. And this, this question is, let's see, who is it from? This question is from um, Akanika. And uh, Akanika says the following. Hi, hello, Mark. Firstly, thank you very much for responding to my question in your EE Live question, your EE Live Q and A. You're awesome. All right. Well, it looks like I answered this person's question once before, so we're back at it again. Okay. It says I have another important question. I hope you can respond to this in your EE Live Q and A. I have my dad's real. That's important. My dad's real older brother, who is a Canadian citizen and resides in Canada. Um, I did mention this in my EE profile. The breakdown of my CRS score in my ITA does not mention any points for this. However, our families are not in talking terms. Sound familiar? Mm-hmm. So there's bad blood. I may not be able to provide any documentation. So my question is, do you need to provide proof of relationship for your uncle? Or is that limited to immediate family like spouse, parents, siblings? I understand that there will be a section to upload documents for relatives. What do I do? Well, Kanika, I can tell you, um, I can tell you that this happens to a lot of people. And why are they asking for information about your, your uncle? Well, because under the Federal Skilled Worker Program's eligibility criteria, family members are actually one of the factors uh, within the selection criteria that help you uh, to reach the 67 point minimum threshold for the Federal Skilled Worker Program. So let me go here. I'm just going to open this up here. Once again, we've got this big old screen. 
I gotta figure out a way just to show the one screen. Anyways, so, uh, okay, so this is my Express Entry Do-It-Yourself Guide, and if you click on the, the description, um, you'll see the link to this where you can purchase this, and that's where a lot of the questions that I'm answering come from. But let's go Federal Skilled Worker Program Eligibility, and we're gonna see why these family members are so um, important within the application. So under the Federal Skilled Worker Program, and why don't we make this just a little bit bigger, um, I've got my image there that's not blocking the way, it doesn't look like it. Um, so here you'll see that there are selection factors. So the program is one of the first stages that you have to meet in order to get into Express Entry. So for those of you who are looking to get as many CRS points as possible, having a family member in Canada is really important um, for meeting the eligibility requirements for the Federal Skilled Worker Program. So you can see here that they actually have selection factors right here, and these selection factors are encompassed by age, education, work experience. Sound familiar? Yes, it's the same questions, the same human capital factors that are assessed in the comprehensive ranking system. But this is the first assessment you go through. It asks whether you have a valid job offer, your language ability, and then here it is, adaptability. How well you're likely to settle here. So let's take a look into this selection factor um, and the points, and we're gonna go to adaptability down at the bottom, and you'll see right here, as you go through this, that you can get an extra five points over here on the right if you have a relative in Canada. And who is a relative in Canada? Well, it's a parent, a grandparent, a child, grandchild, your spouse's sibling, you or your spouse's aunt or uncle by blood or marriage. So you can see here that this is the one that is capturing Kanika's issue. And so under the Federal Skilled Worker Program eligibility assessment, this is one of the requirements. So when you are going through the process of submitting your express entry application, what happens is, and actually I'm gonna go in here and I'm just going to close these out of the way so they're not blocking anything. So what you'll realize is that if you are answering the questions truthfully, which obviously you need to answer, if it asks about family members and you list someone that's on that list of, of, um, of uh, um, let me just make sure, yeah, got the right, right view here. If it's on that list under the Federal Skilled Worker Program for, el for relatives, then you're prompted to, to respond and upload documentation to support it. So you can't just ignore it. It's not something that you just ignore. Um, you, you actually have to make sure that you address it in one way or another. You can't answer, no, I have no relatives. When you do, that could be, you could be found to have misrepresented yourself. And I just came back from my meetings with the, um, in Ottawa, uh, with the Canadian Bar Association, uh, where we addressed one of the most cruel things right now that the government is doing, and that's issuing five-year bars for misrepresentation when you, you innocently, um, fail to, to respond to a question correctly. And it's, it's really cruel, I'll be honest. And so the head officials, the heads of the departments and the programs uh, within, you know, whether it's policy or, or all of the, the various divisions and departments within the immigration, um, the various immigration departments, um, some of them were not quite aware at how readily officers were applying these five-year ban, five bans to people like, um, in Kanika's situation, where maybe in, because she knew, and I'm not saying that Kanika is doing this, but some people say, oh, just don't list that family member. You do not do that. Do not follow that instruction. You have to be very careful. You have to answer truthfully, and then you have to use your best efforts to try to get that. If you use your best efforts and you are unable to get the information that, um, that IRCC is asking for, then at that stage, um, then you just do the next best thing which is providing a letter of explanation, explaining, look, I didn't need those five points to get the 67 points in the beginning. So those five points that you've given me, I already meet the eligibility for the Federal Skilled Worker Program without them. So let's leave those aside. And within the comprehensive ranking system, this uncle in, this, in the situation of Katinka here is, is not a sibling, so I'm not getting any comprehensive ranking system points. And so therefore, please, pursuant to A11.2, which is under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, please accept this application, notwithstanding there are some, uh, my inability to prove this relative in Canada. And so that's 
That's basically how you do it. But you have to be careful that you word it properly. You have to be careful that you answer the question truthfully. And more so than ever before, guys, if you make the slightest mistake on your application, it will get returned as being incomplete or refused. And if you're not prepared and, and with the application that you're submitting to know that you have everything 100% correct, you're exposing yourself to losing your opportunity of ever coming to Canada. And especially for someone like Katinka, where she has, um, uh, sorry, Kanika, who has uh, these extra, you know, um, well, basically the situation where, where they're at with their points, it's likely that it's not going to drop da back down again to the point in which they received their ITA this time. It's probably only going up. And so there's just too much to rest on it. It's too much to ride on it. And you don't want to take a chance. So you have to be very careful in how you draft your letter of explanation. And, you know, over the last three years, four years, well, you're, yeah, we're four years into express entry, almost five. Um, over time, I only fully represented people initially. But over time, then I started doing consults. Then it's then I started to do um, what I absolutely love now. And those are reviews. It's my silver plan. And I go through everything with my clients in a Skype screen share just like this. And we go through all of the questions. We go through the profile. We cross-reference the EAPR to make sure the answers you put in there are consistent with your profile. We go through all of the documents. And I even help to draft the letters of explanation. And it's not easy. Even in the best of circumstances, it's not easy. Immigration really makes things tough. And, um, but when it comes to the reviewing and uh, what I do, it's designed to give you the best chance that you can of success and to make sure that you're not missing little things that you otherwise um, uh, would have missed that could result in your application getting returned. All right. So great question, Kanika. Thank you for that. Okay, next question here is Fazia. And Fazia says, Dear Mark and Stephanie, hope this mail finds you well. It does. Although I'll tell you something, guys. This morning, I just could not sleep. So I got up at, well... It was about 2.30 a.m. That's probably why my eyes are a little bit bloodshot this morning because I'm operating on not very much sleep. But I got up at 2.30 a.m. and basically finished the initial draft of the copy for my new website. So I sent it off to the, uh, the web developer and uh, I'm excited because the new website will be launched shortly. All right. So uh, Fazia says, um, I'm the primary applicant but unemployed for the past three years. All the funds required are saved since quite a long now and my husband's savings account, who's the secondary applicant. I'm aware that I'm supposed to provide an authentication letter from him stating that I have access to those funds and can use them too. But my question is, as he is the secondary applicant, we have not mentioned his work history in our express entry profile. However, the funds saved in the savings account are a part of his salary. In this case, do we have to provide bank letter and statements from his salary account too or the bank letter and statements from the savings account uh, would do where all the funds are maintained. Uh, thanking you in anticipation. Okay, so Fazia, when I read this, I must admit I start to freak out a little bit. And gen yes, genuinely, I start to freak out. Because in your question here, you haven't clarified 100% whether or not you've listed the work history in the personal history section. If you, have, if you have not listed work history in the, um, the work history section, that's not a big deal. But it must 100% be listed in the personal history. It has to be. And so I sure hope that that was the case because it could cause huge, huge problems. Um, if you have not yet submitted your application, which I hope is the case, then please, please reach out to me so that I can give you some direction uh, and make sure that you're answering your EAPR correctly so that you're not creating a situation where you could be found to have misrepresented yourself and being rejected from Canada. All right, with that horrible five-year misrep bar. So in these circumstances, 100% um, you're going to include, um, when it comes to reference letters, you've indicated here that your husband had account, an account and that you guys have what appears to be a shared account. If it's in the shared account, then it really doesn't matter. It's the simple statement, like you said, uh, from, from your spouse. And that's what I get in every circumstance, especially um, 
when your spouse is accompanying you to Canada, then you don't have to worry as much about it as if, say, your, your spouse was not accompanying you. So remember that, yes, the authorization letter is always something that I, that I always, always include for um, money that's in a, a, an account, a bank account, that is in the sole, sole possession, or they're the only person on that bank account, and they're an accompanying spouse. I always include that authorization letter, um, but please, when I read your email, I thought, oh, I've got to bring this up. If, you're list, if, you're the, um, if you have a non-accompanying spouse, when it comes to the work history, despite what people say out there, you, you are still okay with listing that there's no work history for, a non, for an accompanying spouse because you're not getting any CRS points for it. But 100%, you must include it in the personal history section. All right? So there we go. So good question, Fazia. Okay, this one's from Maria. Maria says, um, hope you're doing well. My name is Maria uh, from, Cy from Syria. Firstly, let me thank you for your EE DIY step-by-step -step guide and for the great Black Friday offer. You are very, very welcome. I'm happy that it was able to help you, Maria. And I also want to express appreciation to the many, many, many people that subscribe, subscribe to it. Um, it, would, it just blew me away, the, the response. Um, she says here, on February the 22nd uh, of 2020, my spouse's IELTS test results date will expire and that will drop our CRS score to 453. So their current score is 465. Is there any chance for us to get the ITA before February 2020? Um, I did great efforts to reach such a score, but EE draws are about to ruin my dream. Oh, Maria, I'm so sad to hear this. Please advise if I could switch to non-accompanying spouse later on if the cutoff score didn't drop in the next few draws. And of course, if my spouse is unwilling to retake the test due to certain circumstances, considering that my score without spouse is 472. Maria, I can tell you right now, if you have a score of 472, and if you list your spouse as non-accompanying, I recommend 100% that you do that if you want to increase your chances of getting an ITA. It is almost unlikely that it will drop, the, the CRS score will drop below 470 points. So even with 465, it's unlikely that you're going to get an ITA anytime soon. 472 would probably give you a hope of, of getting that ITA. But remember, just go back and watch the videos that I've done with respect to deciding whether or not to include a spouse as a company or not. But in your situation, even 472 is going to be a stretch. So I recommend that you, if you want to book a consult with me, we can talk about all these issues. Um, we can kind of evaluate where you're at. But the reality is when it comes to points, um, if, you know, if you're sitting at 465 right now, it's going to be really unlikely you're going to get drawn. If you list your spouse as non-accompanying and you go to 472, well, that's going to give you at least a hope. So I recommend, Marie, that you consider reaching out and booking a consult. And you can just send an email to me, uh, mholthy at holthylaw.com, or you can still send it to Stephanie. That's fine, too. Okay, there you go. All right, next question. And I think we're going to end here for the email questions. So this one is from Muhammad. And he says, good evening. I would like to confer that I was not smart enough to judge that the cutoff score has hiked up to 471 and my IELTS would no further help me to cater as after having the desired IELTS score, my CRS, score, CRS is 445, and the profile is based on my spouse coming along with me for immigration. Is there any way we can increase the points or can hope to apply and receive the ITA? My wife has given IELTS, but her score was five, and her education is a two years bachelor in arts, which I have not verified yet from Wes, as the consultants first told me it is not required. So Muhammad, to start with, and then you say, can you please help me? Muhammad, the best thing for you to do is to book a consult. And Stephanie kind of went through these, and we probably would have caught this and, and just sent the email directly to you. But many, many people are asking this. What can I do? There's a couple things that you need to remember. Some of the provincial nominee programs have passive notifications of interest. In other words, just having your profile in the pool if your occupation is in an occupation that is in demand in one of those provinces, it's possible you could get a notification of interest um, even when your scores are below, even when they're 445. The last Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program draw was just, the lowest score was just over 400. 
So that's always a reason to keep your profile in, um, in the express entry pool. Um, when it comes to choosing to list a spouse as non-accompanying, some people have to make that decision and it's cruel. And, you know, I bring this up with the government all the time that they're, they're forcing families apart um, when it means that, excuse me, by listing a spouse as non-accompanying, it results in you, um, your, I, your comprehensive ranking system score to be ranked as an individual. And for many people, that means it's going to be higher. So in a world that is so very, very competitive, and as you see here, Muhammad 471 is correct, um, and it's only going to increase. Um, as all of these over 700,000 international students transition to permanent residence, the scores are going to go up and up to the point where even the international students are not going to qualify. But as it stands right now, um, yes, uh, I, I recommend maybe, Mohammed that you reach out as well and book a consult. Um, I've talked about this a little bit already, but the best way to do that is just send me an email to mholthy at my new email address, which is holthylaw.com and uh, we can set up a consult and we can go through this with you because you have to really take a careful, careful look at this. All right. Okay, let's end there with those ones. I'll leave my, my email address right here so you guys can see what it is. And that's the main point of contact for me now. Um, so let's see what we have for, for questions from individuals. And I'm going to scroll here and see what we have. So anyone who has posted a question already, hold off. Uh, well, sorry, you're going to need to post it again. Um, Let's just see here. I'm going to go through and acknowledge everybody that has been tuning in. Uh, let's see where we left off with. Okay, Milton is Cameroon. Welcome, Milton. Yeah, we have a phenomenal uh, African presence this uh, today. Really, really cool. Um, and then we have Amir Yes, uh, Rura Udin from Dhaka. Um, let's see here. Ayad is Egypt. And then Latino Cafe Lethbridge. Oh, hello. How are you guys doing? It is so awesome. Good to see you guys. Um, let's see. Uh, Siddhar, Siddharth. Just trying to make sure I haven't missed anyone here. Um, okay, Rura says, Hi, Mark. Could you please make a video on how to write a CV according to the Canadian style? Thanks in advance. I could do that. I could totally do that. I think what I need to do is create a package for people settling in Canada. Some of the tips and strategies for, for doing all kinds of things. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, okay. Elias. Oh, my friend. Yes, we better get finished this pretty quick because you're coming up next, aren't you, my friend? <laughs> we are going to be doing the review, aren't we, Elias? Very cool. Okay. He says, that's absolutely true. The review is awesome and thorough. <laughs> you bet, Elias. Okay, and then Chidi says, I missed the Black Friday sale. Now I want to cry. Chidi, if you send me a message, I will, I will give you an opportunity to have access to that, okay? I don't want anyone to, to miss out. I can only keep it open for so long, um, especially when I offer it at a 70% off discount. But Chidi, if you reach out to me by a messenger, I'll give you a code that will allow you to access it at that low rate, okay? And what was it, guys? Well, 70% off. It was $149.10 US. So I'll send that to you because I don't want anyone to miss out on it, um, especially as we're closing in on Christmas, right? Okay, Sarah says, is it necessary to mention about the relatives in Canada? It is, Sarah. And as I indicated in my... Um, uh, in, in the video, the very first question that I answered, it is so important. Otherwise, it would be considered a misrepresentation. Uh, expected score for tomorrow? Eh, I'm going to go with probably 472. That's what I'm going to go with. Maria says, thank you, sir, for answering my question. I've already submitted my profile with the accompanying spouse. Can I change it later without harm? The money account is in his name solely, not a joint. Okay, Maria, yes, you can change it. And if the money is solely in his account, then um, yeah, you would need confirmation that those funds are available. And in all honesty, um, if you ultimately decide to have him as non-accompanying, then I actually prefer that the money is transferred into a, an account that you control if the intention is for you to come to Canada. And then that there's a sworn statement confirming that those funds are available to you. Okay, Masood says, personal history query. Okay, hello Mark, I'd like to know how to explain distance education outside Canada 
along with work. The distance education has been obtained from another country. Would it raise a police clearance certificate requirement? Or should I explain it in the letter of explanation? So no, it should not, but it depends on how you answer the question. So you'll know, and actually I'll show you guys here. Uh, let's see if I can jump back to my page here and then I'll shift this over. I'm slowly getting the hang of this. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's go into, um, uh, let's go to a new page here and we're going to type in EE -E, completeness check right here and then I'm going to show you when it comes to distance, distance learning. So I'm going to put here and I'm going to go distance. Okay, so here's what you do. So if you have a situation where you are, um, where you're studying via distance learning, there are specific instructions on what to put in your application when you're answering those questions. Okay. Um, now let me just see if we can find it. So right here you'll see applicants are instructed to indicate that their education was completed by correspondence by typing in brackets by correspondence on the same line as the educational institution name found in the education background information. Okay. So ultimately by doing that you then notify immigration that it was obtained by correspondence. And then in the location where you study, you indicate where you're actually living. And that way it's not going to trigger a police certificate request. If you've listed that you've been studying in the United Kingdom, um, taking a master's degree, but it was completed online or virtually, if you did not put your address as being where you were actually living, but you indicated, um, sorry, if you didn't put, um, the location of study as where you are currently living, but instead put it where the educational institution is located, it will trigger a police certificate requirement. Um, but then in your letter of explanation, you explain clearly that you never spent any time there. It was a completely um, online course. And uh, as it indicates here, you're going to put in brackets by correspondence on the same line as the education institutional name. All right, good stuff. Okay, next question here uh, is Ralph, and he says, Hi, Mark, hope you're doing well. Please, if someone is not eligible for EE, means not more than 67%, is it possible to apply for a PNP not aligned with EE? I guess as well, not need to calculate CRS score. So, Ralph, yeah, it, it just depends on the Express Entry program. There are a number of them that are not tied to Express Entry. Um, but I'll be honest, to get now to get through Express Entry, you pretty much really need to have um, some connection with Canada. There are very, very few programs that actually offer um, an ability to immigrate without uh, a job offer. Okay. Um, Elias says, hi, Mark. I finally made it to the EE Live. See you soon. <laughs> you bet, Elias. I'm looking forward to it. And it looks like it's going to be in about one hour here. Okay, uh, Sarah says, what if I didn't mention about my relatives in my profile and received an ITA? Sarah, that is bad. You need to 100% address that omission in your EAPR. And I recommend once again that you, you send me an email right here and indicate that you talked to me on my EE Live Q&A and we should set up a paid consult to work through that because you, you've got an issue here. If you've received your invitation to apply, you haven't disclosed your relatives. Um, it could be considered misrepresentation if you proceeded forward without correcting that mistake. And there is an ability to correct it, but you have to be careful how you do that. Um, Avneet says, hello, Mark, can we change the knock after an ITA? Yes. And do you know what, guys? I, I want to, this, it all has to happen at the EAPR stage, but there are a number of different factors that are at play here. So we're going to go back in here. I'm going to share my screen with you guys again. This time we're going to pull up something called the A11.2 and I'm going to pull it up right here. And this is the assessment that the officer uses when they're trying to decide whether or not to reject your application when you have made a change from your profile to your EAPR. So whether it's a knock, whether it's if you haven't changed, if you haven't mentioned a relative and now you want to, so understand that there are, there is room to make arguments for an officer to let the application go forward, but an officer always has discretion. So these are the policy guidelines that are given and they're the program delivery instructions for officers who are processing express entry applications. Okay. And so the most important thing to understand is that 
under this section A11.2, an officer may not issue a visa to an applicant who did not or does not meet these two things, okay? Meet the express entry minimum criteria, so the minimum entry criteria, or did not or does not possess the qualifications for which they received their CRS score at the time when the invitation to apply was issued or the EAPR was received by IRCC. So basically what this means is if there's any change in your application from when you submitted your profile to when you submit your electronic application for permanent residence, if it affects your eligibility through say the Federal Skilled Worker Program, for instance, you no longer meet the 67 points or your comprehensive ranking system score, if they were to reassess it, now falls below the level where you received your ITA. In those circumstances, an officer can and will reject your application. So the important thing for you guys to realize is that, um, yes, some changes can be made, but you have to be so careful in how you explain it. And in the case of you, Avneet, yeah, it could be an issue if you, um, if you need to change that knock. All right. Um, Katamba says, M Mark, friends are waiting for the good end of year offer. <laughs> Katamba, you need to become an affiliate, my friend. Okay, I want to show you guys one other thing. Many of you probably don't understand that as either. And today is the 10th, I think. Yes, it's December the 10th. And I want to show you something on my Express Entry site here. So if you go to the bottom of this screen, there's all my video testimonials and everything associated with this. If you go to the bottom of my Canadian Immigration Institute website, doo -doo 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 -doo, you'll see at the bottom there's a little link here called affiliate. And when you click on that affiliate link, you can become an affiliate. And what does that mean? It essentially means when you, you can earn 30% when someone purchases using your affiliate link. And the very, very first payment right now will be made for sales, for this big last booming sales, um, will be on December the 15th. So in five days, my current affiliates who, when people subscribe to the course through their link, um, they now are paid a 30% commission for referring the course to other people. And that's what the affiliate process is like. So if you want to become an affiliate, you can go right here and sign up. And actually what I'll do is I'll just make a copy of that link and I'll post it right into the comment section. And I'd love for you guys to join me, especially you guys who are, who are already sharing and telling people about the course. Um, I want you to have the opportunity. Um, so, you know, I want you to have the opportunity for you to be compensated for what you're doing to help me grow. So I really appreciate it. So I just thought I'd share that with all of you fine folks. Okay, so as we indicated, um, and I'll jump back here, as I indicated uh, already, the um, when it comes to <coughs> excuse me when it comes to uh, the ITA and that delicate balance between changing information on the EAPR, you really have to be careful. All right, uh, Maria says my brother got married to a Canadian and he is starting his PR process. Awesome. Do I need to wait him to receive his PR to indicate him as a family member in Canada? Yes, Maria, you do. He has to be a permanent resident and he has to be living in Canada. So those are critical aspects. So he can't just be a, the subject of it. Now, I hope you know, Maria, that I offer the exact same services for spousal sponsorships. In fact, in our office, we probably do, well, we used to do more spousals, but now I probably do more express entry. But I love doing spousal sponsorships and I can do reviews just like I do for express entry. So if your brother and his spouse are looking for a little bit of assistance, Maria, I would be delighted to review their spousal application before it gets, uh, before it gets sent out. Because remember, the same one-touch cruel policy exists with spousal sponsorships, just like it does with express entry. And if they make one mistake or miss one document, the application will get returned and they'll have to refile it again. All right. Um, Chidi says, thank you so much. You're very welcome, Chidi. All right, Dehoff says, any chance for someone with a score of 396 for PNP with NOC 0124? So Dehoff, that's something I can't answer, my friend. There have been passive expressions of interest or notifications of interest extended by some provinces to people as low as, you know, the low 300s um, in some provinces, but it all depends on the occupation. And there are no specifically set NOC codes for many of those provinces. 
So I can't answer that to Hoff, but there's no harm in keeping your application in there. One of the things I always advise my clients is that if you are considering submitting an application in the pool, but you know your score is low, and you're considering maybe going to school, then hold off on submitting that profile until you've applied for a study permit, and then you can consider moving forward. Um, because sometimes officers will use the fact that you've got a profile in the queue as evidence that you want to become a permanent resident of Canada. And when you're applying for a study permit or a work permit or a visitor visa to come to Canada, you have to convince an officer that you have temporary intent. In other words, that you will actually return back to your home country when your temporary status has expired. But some officers will take a look at that profile and say, oh, come on, there's no way that... Uh, um, that this individual is actually going to go home. They're going to stay here if their status runs out. They just won't go home. And so then they refuse it. So if you have, in your case, to have, if you, if you don't intend to study or anything like that, then yeah, there's no harm in putting your application in the pool. Okay, Moizadin says, Hi Mark, can I go to the U.S. border to get the visa extended, changed, as my work permit is about to expire in March 2020? I heard this option has been removed. Moizadin, this is another consult we'll need to have because, yes, the northern, um, the, 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 uh, the southern Ontario region and parts of, of Quebec have fl these policies against flag pulling on certain days. And yes, they make life miserable for people who are trying to do that. But Moizadin, you need to kind of give me a little bit more information. Uh, same situation. I recommend that you book a consult because they can be awful and they can right now what they're doing is they are looking for ways to refuse people they are going out of their way to find creative ways to send people home when they go to do a, a work permit application at the border because they don't want to wait for an inland work permit to be processed but you are looking to extend you said uh, but you've also indicated change your work permit and so that's where i'd like to talk to you if you want to book a consult moizadin we can connect and I can explain this because if you're just applying to extend your work permit, then you may very well be able to benefit from implied status if you submit it before your permit expires in March. But March is still quite a while and if you start right now, it may not have to wait too much longer. Now I know it's over 100 days processing and you have to take that into consideration, but the borders are volatile and I do not willy-nilly send my clients down there unless there's absolutely no other alternative. Okay, Masood says, paper application query. Okay, the IMM forms have a very little space to type in the proper details. Can I leave the forms blank and attach an additional sheet with complete details, or do I need to write something on the main form? So Masood, you always use up whatever space you can on the main form. Some of them are validated. So remember, when it's a validated form, any information that you include as a separate attached sheet is not going to be included in that barcode, that validated um, form. But yes, that's exactly what you do regardless. You need to make sure that you notify the officer right at the beginning in a nice cover letter that you couldn't fit everything into the form and so therefore you had to attach a sheet and then that just brings them uh, uh, up to speed with where they need to look for for your information. Okay, uh, Maria says, I have another brother that was deported from Canada this year. Oh, I'm so sorry. Does this affect my application somehow? Should I explain about that? Permanent resident, Maria? No, it doesn't. It doesn't impact on you. Um, sometimes if family are deported, it can impact on temporary applications, but um, it's highly unlikely that that would affect a permanent application. Okay, Katamba says, Mark, are there online Canadian courses that one can take so as to claim the Canadian education related points? No. In order to claim those education points, Katamba, you actually have to be in Canada. That's one of the requirements. Same thing for work experience. You have to be physically present in Canada, working for a Canadian company, physically present in Canada, studying at a Canadian institution. So you can't do it virtually. Um, Chidi says, and it's my birthday. Well, congratulations, Chidi. That's awesome. Congratulations. Happy birthday to you. Wow, that's great. Your 21st birthday, congratulations. Okay, uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, Maria says thank you. Katamba says birthday, Nene. <laughs> Katamba says happy birthday. And Ali here looks to be like the last comment for today and then we'll end our, our uh, 
the EE Live Q&A today, but Ali says, I found an employer able to send me a job offer, but we need an LMIA for low wages. Um, you've got here EIMT for low wages. Not quite sure what that is. I encourage him to buy your guide, but I see only guide for high wages. The content and procedure, it, it is quite the, the same as low wages. Um, and if I buy it in his place to encourage him and avoid burden, is there any discount for Christmas time? Ali, that course is actually priced at an introductory level. So the 300, I usually charge my clients um, between 3,500 and $4,000 to do an LMIA. So the $300 that I am offering it at right now is actually at um, a rate that is already drastically discounted. So Ali, I'm building out that course but um, I'm happy to have a consult to explain anything with you. F to a large extent, the information contained in there is very transferable, so even with low-wage positions, but you need, to f you need to really, really pay attention to what the options you have are after to become a permanent resident, because once you come as a low-skill you know, or a low-wage candidate, then you have to ensure that there's a pathway forward. And so a consult is the best way to, to sort that out. Chidi says, thank you. Katama says, thanks, Mark. And Freddie throws in one last question. Uh, oh, Ali says, the low wage, is, is it same as high wage? It's not the same identical. It is a little bit different. And I definitely need to address that and create a new video for that. But a lot of the instructions, a lot of the guidance on how you do things is very, very similar. And I referenced low wage as well within that particular guide. All right, so Freddie says, what is the minimum age of someone pursuing education in Canada? There is no minimum age. I've got younger children that are in middle school, you know, the age of 13, 14, that come and study. It just depends on the circumstances. All right, and Siddharth says, thank you, Mark. You bet, guys. It was a really, really great opportunity uh, to connect with all of you once again. And uh, remember, as of this Friday will be my last day here at Stringham LLP. Super, super grateful for the opportunity that I had to be here. Just tons of really good people, and I will definitely continue to refer work back to them. And hopefully there'll be opportunities for me to assist um, with immigration um, as well and to be a part of uh, um, what's, what's going on here on the immigration front, especially with Billy and Stephanie staying here. So I also wanted to let people know at the end of this video that I am in the process of looking for a new intake support person to basically fill the role that Stephanie has filled for me these, this past year. I will be sending out a job description and it will be basically a contract position for a few hours each day to help manage the intake. And it's a virtual position, so it doesn't matter where you live in the world, anyone is eligible to, um, to apply for it. Um, compensation and, and everything will be explained in the job description when I send it out but uh, you should be able to look for it here on all of my social media channels here in just a little bit, t uh, probably either today or tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. And I want to thank all of you for joining me here on another Express Entry Live Q&A. And I'll pop this up as well. Remember that if you have a question that you'd like to answer and you're watching this as a video, you can send it to mholthy at holthylaw.com, which is my new email address, and put EE Live Q&A in the subject line. And in the coming days here and weeks, stay tuned for my new firm website to be launched where I talk about all of my various service levels that I'll be offering, gold, silver, bronze. Yes, I do it for Express Entry, but I do the same thing for all kinds of immigration applications. I'll be releasing more do-it-yourself guides and I'm just looking forward to providing so much more value and just being here um, in, in a very, very uh, focused and strategic way to support all of you in your journey as you navigate this crazy world that we call Canadian immigration. All right, guys, take care and we'll see you next week, if not sooner, if I decide to pop in sometime here in the coming days. But I wish you all the best and thanks so much for just supporting me and being a part of this. Take care.